Mistress Natalia and Master Llewellyn. The first and the most recent Laurels of Lockhart. And thank you for joining us. Thank I would you. First, <laughs> um, firstly, would like to give an acknowledgement of country. Good nobles, we come here together in the spirit of fellowship, deepening of our skills, sharing of our knowledge, and a shared interest in the search to find truth through experimental archaeology and historical inquiry. It is in this context that I, Altani Kalagu, on behalf of my kingdom, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we gather. We recognize their continuing connection to land and culture, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Greetings, sir. master and mistress. Thank Hi. you for coming on with us this evening. Hello. And the special guest of the brand new puppy. It's very exciting. Yes, this is uh, Lafayette. <laughs> Lafayette. Lovely. Great name. Pretty, not a real Zoom meeting without a pet. Somewhere. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Wandering across the screen, yes. <laughs> so what type of um, breed of dog is he? He's a she, skipper key. So she he. or he? he? He. He is a skipper key. Um, he is 10 weeks old. So he's just a little thing. Where are you going? <laughs> exploring, mum. Exploring. I've, I've only just gotten here. I have to explore. <laughs> Well, that's great. Uh, <laughs> love it. Um, so usually we start off our interviews by finding out a little bit about each of you and how you started in the SCA. So Llewellyn, I'd love to hear your story. Well, um, it was a long time ago. Um, the When I was about 16 or 17, my sister went to university and hooked up with a bunch of reprobates um, who also were hooked up with a different bunch of reprobates who played dress ups and drank a lot and hit each other with sticks. And that sounded like fun. So uh, I ended up going along to some, well, started going along to a couple of events. And uh, after she got over the frustration of me honing on her shiny new thing, um, we, we both got pretty involved. Um, and yeah, she ended up moving to the States to do a PhD, as one does. Um, but I hung around in Christchurch and uh, then met a girl and moved to Brisbane, as one does. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, sometime thereafter got borrowed. Um, <laughs> so how many years have you been a Laurel of Lockhart? Well, how many years has Lockhart been a kingdom? 18, 2002? 2002, August, if I recall correctly. So, uh, yeah, uh, nine, come 18 and a half. Um, so I'd been, I joined when I was sort of 16 and uh, got laurelled just under 10 years. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been a while. Um, and your specialty? My specialty, well, I, I got uh, elevated for 14th century men's clothing, as you can tell by looking at me, clearly. Um, uh, uh, I... I moved house a few years ago because I was getting a bit... I, I, took a, uh, a bit of a break uh, due to burnout and life. Uh, when I came back, I was having real trouble re-engaging with the, the area that I'd been working in previously, um, and but ended up moving into Elizabethan men's costuming uh, and found that that really sort of helped me refine the passion and excitement. Yeah. Very cool. And how was, about <laughs> please, England? I was just going to ask Natalia, how, what's your what's your story for starting in the SCA? Um, so I'm from the states, and when I was 
Oh, gosh. Um, in my very early 20s, I went to um, Medieval Times, which is a dinner theater uh, centering around jousting. And I was very excited about it. It was very much fun. And my friends that went with me said, well, you know, if you really like this kind of, you know, thing, dressing up medieval stuff, there is a society that does this. And I went, really? And so I uh, called up the local canton and they told me that they were having their annual general meeting, but I was more than welcome to come if I wanted. And so I grabbed one of my very good friends and made him go along with me because I wasn't going by myself. <laughs> and um, we signed up that day, even though it was just a regular, you know, boring meeting. And um, we had a lot of fun. And then um, in the States, the society does a lot of education for schools, um, going out, you know, hitting one another for, for profit, basically. Um, and sorry, dogs. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> and um, so one of the schools had asked if we could do, um, if we could come out and teach a little bit about uh, 1550s Russia. And I was like, okay, that's cool, um, but we need garb. So I went on to, this was so long ago that we didn't have Facebook or you know, anything like that. And I went on to um, the message boards and I said to you know, all of Ansandri, does anyone know what they used to wear in Russia in 1550s as I'm in the United States and we're still at the end of the Cold War. And, <laughs> um, my now husband actually sent a message back and said, yes, I have some information on that. And I said, great. And he sent that to me. And um, then that started my friendship with my now husband. And eventually I moved here to Australia and of course continued in the society because what does one do when one moves to another country? And so I've been here for <clears throat> 20, three years, 24 years. That's awesome. So you moved here for love? Oh, well, yeah. Many years after I met him, I, I moved here for love. We both uh, were single at the same time and said, you know, look, you could do worse than your best friend, right? So. <laughs> That's awesome. And what's your, what's your laurel speciality? Uh, so I was laureled for cooking primarily or like with a specialty in uh, 13th century Mongolian. So I've actually been requested to ask, what is your difference in your lamb jam compared to um, Master Drakey? Um, I followed the recipe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask and why is it wrong? <laughs> so so Drake um, didn't... Uh, the, the, it, it basically starts with saying, you know, take a, a half of a sheep and throw it in some water. And um, the amount of water was a, a bucket of water. So what size bucket? <laughs> so I started to do some research on that. And once I figured out how much water it was and how much bone was in and, and sinew was in the meat, I realized that it was actually an aspic. So it's a jellied meat versus what? his lamb jam, which is pretty much pomegranate jam lamb. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we have lots of fun joking with one another about that. But yeah, I followed the directions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's I'm awesome. sure my husband will be interested to know that. <laughs> have, you, have you had a side by side taste test like competition? Yes, yeah. yes. And it, it, they're two totally different things really. Um, I don't eat lamb at all. I mean, I picked a really, really hard thing to, to work in. Um, I am intolerant of lamb. So um, it makes me quite ill and can, in certain circumstances, actually send me to hospital. So I don't actually really taste any of the food that I make. Um, I, I use my friends and family for that. Other people as your taste testers. That's right. Yeah. Well, welcome to my kitchen. <laughs> I have no idea what this tastes like. Enjoy. <laughs> I'm sure anything that you make will be delicious. 
Ah, uh, yeah. I think it's a winner because there's a lot of period food which is just like it doesn't go with mundane tastes. So I think having someone else to try it first is like a, a solid plan. Carrots are delicious. Like, don't get me wrong. There's some great recipes out there, but some. Mm. <laughs> well, you can you can misstep. Um, my poor family has uh, gone through what we call slime balls. Um, which is a uh, specialty that is actually called water dragonlets. They're uh, pork meatballs, um, but you roll them in starch. And if you don't get the starch just right, they're slimy on the outside. So yeah, it took me a while to um, figure out the correct amount of, of starch to not make it slimy, but make it hold together. You have a puppy. I have a Marshall. You have an angel. Hello. <laughs> I want to see Angel just climbing all over your head like the puppy was doing. Yeah. <laughs> she will. <laughs> ah, cute. <laughs> uh, so the well, and I'm I'm keen to hear a little bit about your journey um, along the path to becoming a laurel and when were you offered and, and why you decided to, um, if you were offered in advance, why you decided to do it at coronation for our first um, kingdom event or as opposed to before that? Um, well, I had, I, I grew up in Southern Guard um, in the kingdom of Kaid as was. Right, have I, right, I'm, hmm, this, um, my phone is running slightly flat, so I'm going to need to plug it in and then probably need to hold it to stabilize it. But um, yeah, I grew up in Southern Guard, um, Kingdom of Kaid, um, and then had moved to St. Florian um, and had been there for a couple of years and was going to festival um, and uh, had been, uh, you know, popping my stuff into Laurel Prize and having lovely conversations with people. And then the, the year before um, we went Kingdom, um, Portia and Uther were over from um, the West and were at festival and Portia came around and chatted to me and we had a lovely chat and you know, I can't remember the exact exchange, but it was something along the lines of, oh, okay, it was, it's really nice to have, you know, visiting laurels displaying in Laurel Prize. And it's like, yeah, your majesty, <clears throat> about that. Um, and, oh, okay, right, oh, well, lovely. Um, and then, yeah, the, the next day I, I got uh, one of those stereotypical grabbed by a handful of random laurels for, for an urgent uh, uh, errand that's right over there, just in this tent. Oh, hello, your majesty, uh, conversations. Um, and yeah, could pretty much, because we were heading into the transition to kingdom. I mean, having, having grown up in Kaid, I didn't really feel a, a particularly strong attachment to the West. Um, I felt a strong attachment to Lockhart because, well, you know, I had all these friends in Australia and, you know, I was part of the, I was one of the people who was quietly agitating to say, hey, New Zealand should join Lockhart. Wouldn't that be fun? Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I was, while well, I was offered the opportunity to either step up, you know, be, be elevated in the final Western court or in at the, one of the first Kingdom of Lockhart courts, um, the, the Kingdom of Lockhart felt much more like home to me. That's lovely. Do you, um, do you feel like, because you were the first peer maid, which you learned tonight, <laughs> first peer maid under the new kingdom, do you feel like you've got a, a sense of responsibility or attachment to um, to the kingdom as that first peer? Nah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, I mean, 
But it's, it's a funny one because, uh, but both because the, there's no no more than I feel a sense of responsibility as being a peer. You know, when I'm putting on my being a grown up pants. Um, as far as anything particularly special, it's one of the funny things about because I was living in St. Florian's at the time um, and St. Florian's in the early 2000s was absolutely overrun with laurels. Um, in all seriousness, it was the Baronial ANS Award. Um, and that, that very much tinged my early experience as a functioning peer. Um, there, there were a lot of things that people warned me about that you know, you experience as a new peer that I just never experienced while I was living in St. Florian's. But then when I moved back to New Zealand three years later, I experienced all of a sudden. Um, what, are, what are some of those things that you... Oh, the, They say that uh, you should have experienced then. It, 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 some of the stuff with people treating you differently because you're a peer, right. um, that sort of stuff. Whereas, you know, in, in St. Florian's we had... I can't even remember how many, 10, 11 laurels. Um, they, everyone had a very, very visceral understanding that, you know, peers have feet of clay. Um, and, the, you know, I may be a laurel, but I'm a men's costuming laurel of the 14th century. So asking me about armoring is going to get you a blank look. Um, whereas... Uh, after I moved back to New Zealand, I, I got for the first time a Master Llewellyn said moment and uh, people asking me in all seriousness about, uh, I can't even remember what the question was, but I, I do remember someone being very shocked when I gave them a blank look and told them they knew more about, I don't know, Flemish embroidery than I did. Um, so yeah, that was... Uh, are you saying that at that first period meeting they don't just download all knowledge about all aspects of medieval life? <laughs> well, it's it's the hug. It's the group hug after the elevation. That's where you get the knowledge. And the cloak the maybe can, enveloping you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why it's quite a, like a lot of people want to get elevated at festival or large events because, you know, if you get elevated at a small regional event, you can end up with major holes in your knowledge. Um, if you don't have a representative sample of laurels there to hug you. Mm. Um, so the collective down consciousness of the lo laurels of Lockhart. Yeah. All right. That's a, a lot to absorb. Mm. Mm. Could you imagine? <laughs> so much information. Okay. And Natalia, you, as the most recent Lockhartian um, laurel. <laughs> well, um, I should say that I too originally was from Kaid. So um, yeah. <laughs> but, um, That's a nice little kind of connection. I yeah. love that. Um, so I was over at a friend's house and I was told that Penny was going to stop by to um, pick up some fabric, which was okay. Because um, anybody that knows me knows that in actuality, I'm very shy. <laughs> and um, so two of my friends were there and there was a table in front of me and Penny walked in and all of a sudden I felt my two friends on either side of me and locking their arms behind me. <laughs> no escape. Yeah, and then Her Majesty asked me to join the, the Order of Laurel, which was absolutely amazing. And I had always said that I would always say no. But I should have known that something was up because only a few weeks before that happened, um, my master uh, told me that if I were to ever be asked to join the Laurels, that I should really think about it. And so I did. <laughs> and I said yes, obviously. But um, yeah, so if it weren't for people telling me that I should think about it and uh, literally holding me in place, um, I would not have uh, probably 
been able to be tracked down. <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, then I kind of had to wait for a while because COVID. And then I didn't get the hug. So I only have my knowledge, sadly, because, you know. It will come. <laughs> I'm sure they won't let you, as once events open wide, they won't let you hanging there, lost yeah. of the consciousness <laughs> of the laurel. A pilgrimage. <laughs> Ooh, that sounds good. I like pilgrimage. <laughs> Do you mind sharing why um, you were thinking that you'd say no if offered? Um, I think that there, there are two things. The first one is that I really am an introvert, like a serious introvert. And the idea of having the title and being called mistress and people coming to me to, to ask me questions uh, is quite overwhelming. Um, and that's why Master Drake wanted me to think about it because um, he's like, you, you have the qualities and you have the knowledge that a lot of people could learn from. And so, you know, it might be something that you need to step out of your comfort zone to be able to do. And so I said, yeah, okay, there's that. And um, the other one is just plain out imposter syndrome. I mean, I know that I don't know as much as I should know. <laughs> and that's kind of, I guess. I, the, the I can tell you from experience that within about 10 years, that'll go away. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> It's Probably not less than about eight, but it's something that you hear a lot across all the orders. Really, is that um, when that offer of elevation and the elevation itself happens, everyone feels like they're not ready or that there's still so much to learn. But I've heard so many people say that it's just the beginning of the journey. Like mm. this is the, the door opening to all the rest of the research and learnings that. Mm. Um, is on your path it certainly has it's not stopping yet there's <laughs> still so far to go um, it's yeah. the problem that when you say laurel or night or pelican you don't think of the newest member of the order you think of the exemplars you know so yes when i was elevated i wasn't rowan nope and uh I'm still not, and that's okay. Um, but yeah, you just spend some time and you settle into the fact that, you know, you slowly but surely have those moments where you go, actually, you know, I, I can do this. I can walk the talk. I can inspire someone to, to do something or you share. Make, you make your passion somebody else's passion and yeah. grow on that and pass it to others. And thus more comfortable away, I suppose, in your own skin, so to speak. Yeah. So, Llewellyn, you say that um, you have done all this costuming uh, research and that's the, the areas of your uh, Laurel subject matter expert. Um, do you have a persona that fits within that? Like, do you... Yeah. Not especially. Well, I, I did when I was, was wearing 14th century. Um, because the, there was a household um, that I played with um, before I moved to Brisbane. Um, the, well, uh, I was squired to uh, Ulster Walton, Sir Ulster Walton and his wife, Alice, um, which was a, it is a story unto itself because uh, Alice was, my sort of artistic laurely mentor, but was not a laurel herself because New Zealand was a very, very small country, a very, very long way away from Kaid. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, when I squired to Ulf, we had some pretty, you know, explicit conversations that I was, I wanted to be a squire because I wanted to be part of their household because I thought they were both pretty awesome. Um, 
and you know, I sort of wanted to be Alice's squire as much as Ulf's. Um, and so we sort of we we functioned as a a hive mind, um, and we sort of had some persona play around being you know a small a rural knight and his household, and I was kind of fit in as kind of their their steward sidekick person. Um, but so that that worked quite well in that part of my my play. Then uh, yes, I. When I came back and decided that I didn't want to do 14th century stuff anymore, I and Elizabethan stuff was a lot more fun, and specifically tending more towards not 16th century English, more sort of 16th century Spanishy, maybe. Um, yeah, being the Welsh steward of a an English knight just doesn't really sink anymore so um yeah so you've actually developed quite a bit of a persona listening to that and a backstory for yeah. yourself I know a lot of people some people do and some people don't so how did you come to that like oh uh Alice um that that you know I said we functioned as a hive mind um Mistress Alice is a uh well a research librarian by vocation if not necessarily by profession anymore um and so yeah she, she went forth and and found uh resources and things that made sense for what we were doing and what we wanted to do oh entirely do you have something like that in your with the time that you've been playing like do you, do you have the persona creation as well you do um yeah so my uh my society name is natalia vladimirova dosh which is russian um i became very interested um when i started to do the research for the school um with 15th there are 1500s Russia and coming from the States, it was, um, I grew up during the cold war. So anything Russian was just basically stripped from any reference that I could get a hold of. And, um, so I was fascinated with the idea of, of playing a Russian, you know, person, um, because, you know, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> And um, was so, it yeah. difficult then? Like, was it really difficult for you to do to follow that passion? It it was. I and it was. Um, I'm fortunate that my family, like, part of my family is Russian, so I was able to get information from that. them. Um, and I have a lot of really good friends that weren't in the United States, so they could get things for me. Excuse me for just a second. <laughs> you need to stop that. Oh. Uh, you're I'm going to tell, I'm going to excuse myself. My child needs to get out of the shower. Oh. <laughs> uh, what is it? You don't, don't perform with children and animals or something? <laughs> yeah. Well, this one's trying to eat the power cable. So, you know, <laughs> let's not do that. <laughs> no, cute. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no problems. So, so Natalia, where did the the interest in Mongolian food come from? If you were spending a lot of time researching Russian and and that persona, um, blame Drake. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that just like the, the you know the phrase we throw out there? <laughs> um, so um, I was uh, over at Drake's house one day, and he said. Natalia, you will not believe what I just got a hold of. And he handed me this huge tome and it was um, a soup for a con. And he said, isn't this interesting? We should play with this. <laughs> and that's how it started. <laughs> and um, when he was uh, 
elevated to Laurel, um, he took me, he turned around from walking out and handed me a belt and said, you're my apprentice now. And I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> and the very first thing he said after that was, and you'll be doing Mongolian cooking. So that's blame Drake. Yeah. Have you enjoyed your travels into Mongolian cooking? Obviously you have, but yeah. What have yeah, you I've found? It. Well, like it's just it's um there because there's contemporary Chinese and Mongolian cookbooks um, from you know the same sort of hundred years, it's very interesting to research the differences. And I'm also very interested in foodways. So where some foods you would find, the Chinese food is very much what you would think of as Chinese. But just, you know, slightly move just a little bit more and you have another type of food that's like Chinese and, uh, you know, Arabic. It's got, there's a, so much influence. And um, the, because the Khans didn't have a problem taking the best of every country they conquered or every piece of land they conquered, there are things in Mongolian cooking that you just don't see anywhere else. And they kind of went, you know, hey, I really like this type of thing, but I don't want it filled with that. I want it filled with this, usually lamb um, <laughs> or mutton. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, it's very interesting how they took things and made it their own. I'd love to hear from both of you on your subjects. What is the weirdest thing you've come across and what is something that you find super exciting that you just need to tell everyone about? Who wants to go first? I don't know about the weirdest thing. The things that I found super exciting um, in my early work, the things I found most exciting were the, and the things where I think I, where I contributed to the arts and sciences of the kingdom, um, were the the bits where um, I or we managed to go against received wisdom about, oh, you can't do that thing, like it's really hard. Um, the the cases in point being you know, bias cut hose and some of the, the leatherworking techniques and shoemaking. Because um, at the point I started working in with bias cut hose, um, I feel weird talking about it because it's now like pretty much AOA 101, like ANS 101. But back at the time, it was like, you know, you wore tights um, and or you wore like baggy pants. The, the idea that you could take non woke you know, tabby woven cloth and actually make hose out of them was considered, oh, that's kind of not really a thing. Um, so the point that I worked out how you do it and that like bias cutting worked and that you could get a spray fit fit across most of your legs, except for the bit just above the ankle, um, that was awesome and proceeded to inflict it on everyone who would stand still and some people who were too slow walking away. Um, in the 16th century stuff, it's the, the amount of the clothing in the, because my, my, uh, my kind of thing in costuming is the sort of detailed techniques stuff um you you get the the bog versus bower bird laurels if you'll forgive it the the please explain um, that <laughs> um uh the the the, the bog laurels that the people who who you if you chuck them in a bog in 300 years time they they wouldn't necessarily be able to tell them from someone from the time period Whereas the, the bowerbird laurels are beautiful and pretty, um, but they're 
the they're concerned with the overall impression. Um, so it's it's the blog models tend to work from the technique up, whereas the other way of working. The other the bower birds work from the outlook first and then delve the, yeah, down into it. They'll start with the silhouette and the the you know the decoration and then work inwards 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 right. um whereas so on a on a good day both of them will be they'll look the same on a bad day the the bog will have beautiful stitching but the clothing will be the wrong shape um whereas you know at the other end of the spectrum you have a beautiful shape with velcro up the back um <laughs> but uh so yes, I'm, I'm very much of the detail. Um, all of which is to say that for me, the thing that's really excited me with the 16th century stuff is how much of the extant really high-end clothing is incredibly bodgy in all the places it doesn't have to be good. So you have this um, silk velvet doublet where the the lacing strips under the uh, you know under under the skirt to lace them to your hose, like they've been sewn with about six stitches each. I mean the the eyelets that are showing are beautifully worked with like embroidery levels of deliciousness, but the ones that are out of sight, it's like stick a hole in it take a couple of stitches to keep it open, you're done, love. <laughs> um, and similarly, the internal construction, like the external stuff, it's it's mostly, you know, lovely and neat. The internal stuff is like, right, okay. It gives us some hope yet. <laughs> exactly. It's, I mean, it's, the, it's all as good as it needs to be. And the outer, because it's, you know, for people who can pay a new house cost for one set of clothes. Mm. The outer is beautiful, mostly. Um, some of it is surprisingly dodgy in places, but the interior, it's all, it's strong, it's sturdy, and it's never going to be seen. Yeah. I love that. Like, it's, it's so refreshing to hear that. There's always the, when you start costuming and um, whatever period that you're looking at, everyone's like, all right, just machine sew it and then hand finish it. It's like, it's that same kind of vibe. Like, doesn't matter if you can't see it, do whatever you need to do to put it together and then just have all the outside shown bits finished nicely. Well, like that people saying you should never machine finish stuff, like really good the, the back stitching on the on my shirts, which you won't be able to see, almost certainly you may be able to. There's there's a bunch of, of back stitching along the, the cuffs of all of these shirts that is visually indistinguishable from machine sewing. It's hand sewn, I promise you, but because of the way it's sewn, you end up with the, the back to back loops on both sides that makes it just look like it's been machine sewn. Um, so. That's good. But anyway, so yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of things where it's like, no, no, like there are ways to do this fast and easy and it looks just as good. Yeah, I love it. Natalia, uh, oh, sorry, Glenn. No, I was doing the same thing. <laughs> Natalia. You're weird and wonderful, and <laughs> you're wonderful. Yes, um, you are. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, honestly, my favorite thing is that you know I read the directions when Drake didn't, but um, that's probably a student peer relationship thing. Um, I think one of the things that I'm proudest about actually is that recipe because in it it uh, tells you to bake pomegranate and up until the point that I had read that I didn't know that you could <laughs> or why you would want to <laughs> and um, so there was a, a, 
a very long couple of days on Skype with um, a few friends trying to figure out exactly what the recipe meant. It, it said to bake the pomegranate in a cup of oil. The whole pomegranate or just the seeds? Well, it doesn't say. <laughs> so we ended up um, trying seeds, whole pomegranates, uh, checking to see if you could actually like eat the papery uh, sections of the pomegranate and not yep. poison someone. Um, <laughs> Lots of research. Um, and and, and to, uh, do the volunteer taste testing for that one. <laughs> Take actually, your least favorite apprentice. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, hmm. No, I actually tasted it. Um, the, and then there's the problem of, of what is a cup of oil? Because I had never run into the measurement of one cup within any of the period location type references. So um, yeah, we tried all sorts of things, you know, is it a drinking vessel or a little, you know, teacup or, or what? And it eventually dawned on us. And I, I actually sent the recipe to the original recipe to a friend that uh, translates uh, Mongolian Chinese. And um, it came back the same English recipe. So um, it was still a, a cup of oil. And then um, we were talking it through and um, it came down to, I wonder if it is an oiled cup. Oh, and so we so tried you... that and it worked because everything else was just horrible. It was absolutely horrible. And yeah, they oiled the vessel that they were cooking right. the pomegranate in. And I subsequently found that it was easiest to, to remove the, the seeds and put them in and then, and then cook them. And they uh, uh, kind of become almost like a current. And when you chew on them, they pop with flavor. So that was probably one of the things that I was proudest about. That and finding out how much uh, of the starch to put on the water dragon lets. <laughs> It would just be really nice if they would include amounts, you know. It does not help when you say a bucket of water. It just doesn't. Just give me an amount. Um, <laughs> it's just because there's like more it was like regional differences as well, or just keeping that secret in the family so somebody else can't use that same recipe. Yeah, I, I mean, I grew up with a grandparent who uh, taught me to cook and, and she would say things like, you know, the amount of butter, the size of a duck's egg. And so, you know, okay, duck's egg, butter. Okay. There you go. You know, but without any reference at all, you know, as to what it could possibly be, it's hmm. just like, <laughs> but that's, it's the sleuthing that's fun. Yeah. Um, it's the, the sitting and going, okay, you know, what kind of bucket is this? Oh, it's a very specific bucket. It's the bucket that they used to feed the camels in. Okay, great. Well, what size bucket is that? So, okay, well, we don't have any extant copies of them, but we do know that the ones that they use nowadays are the exact same size. Okay, great. So what size is that? Oh, wait, they don't actually use them as buckets anymore. They're actually baskets. But yeah, eventually you can find out the volume. <laughs> A lot of intricate research with that too. Yeah. So I, I think that's kind of, the, that's a fun bit of research, right? Is trying to figure out what it actually, how was it made? Um, what is the fabric? What is, you know, mm. how did they make the inks that they used? You know, that kind of thing. So, yeah. That's, that's one of the things that I definitely experienced moving from, 14th century costume into 16th. Whereas in the 14th, you've got, you know, lots of illumination depicting clothing, but it's fairly cartoonish. Um, and a lot of it's allegorical. And you've got one and a bit extant shirts and a whole lot of extant outerwear from the Schossner Stigs. Um, but 
But then you move to the 16th century and it's like, oh, okay, how many hundred extant, like not just they still exist, but unreconstructed um, uh, garments from the time period would you like? Oh, here are the photorealistic paintings of all of it. Oh, right, here's the tailor's manuals with instructions on how to assemble these. Oh, and here's the, the accounts for buying all the bits that you need. Um, it makes it so much easier, <laughs> um, which was a lot of what attracted me because you, you know, it's, it's a very different way of operating. I get all my friends to do the research and then I just make the pretty stuff. <laughs> I'm sure you did research in your first reign, England. Uh, Portia actually helped a lot with that for getting our Merovingian and, and Theodoric as well. Like he, he did all the research for it. And then um, Portia came in and helped us kind of actually work out how to turn that into clothes and <laughs> um, help us pattern it all. So yeah, I, Again, I, I helped make it, but I certainly didn't know any of the research before that point. <laughs> um, if, you, if you guys were to pick a new area of art or science, what, what would interest you to, to start from scratch? As an outside of costuming, for oh, me, yeah. or yeah, anything. the particular subjects that you're doing, that you've done. Well, I've I've dabbled in woodworking a bunch, and I've dabbled in music a bunch. So possibly exploring more into one of those. Um, sorry. Oh yeah, there's been some baking from time to time as well. Says says her on the bed. Um, so, that, I mean, doing less dabbling there and more actual research into, into period baking techniques would definitely, I mean, that's about number five or six on my top list, list of top three list of things to do already. So. Delicious. Natalia? Um, so I have a fascination with the way that the Mongolian li lives revolved around their herds. So I would really, and I also have this really horrible hate for steak tartare and the horrible stories that go along with it. I can demonstrate that there was no way that a Mongolian would throw a slab of meat underneath their saddle and ride all day. Um, <laughs> But I would, I would love to do more research into it. There have recently been a couple of, of finds that have very good complete horse and saddle uh, burials with the um, Mongolians. So I think that's probably where I am going to head is to, to actually find out. I, I suspect that they had a bag that went down the, the uh, center of the saddle where they would stuff their food because they didn't generally carry bags when they would go out on scouting trips. So I think that that's probably what we would find if we actually pulled it all apart. And that's kind of what I want to do. If I weren't going to do that, then um, it would be probably um, a study into uh, breeding of dogs in period and showing dogs and, and, and how that started and why it started. Also seeing how dogs have changed or various breeds of dogs have changed mm -hmm. since period to nowadays too. Yeah. I mean, originally they would have, a majority of the dogs were working dogs. Mm. That's why you had them. I mean, yes, there were a couple of lap dogs. Um, and now a majority of our dogs are pets, not working dogs. So they have changed a lot. And I just, I'm, I'm very fascinated with where, what part of us finally decided I want to have a beauty contest for my working animal? Because, you know, that's what dog shows are. It's like, yeah. oh, look, you're the prettiest, you win. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 
So yeah, so I, I would be very interested in doing some research into that. Now, as one of you is an old Laurel and a young Laurel, do either of you have any students as yet? Llewellyn, I'm sure you would by now. Well, oh, yes. No. I, I, I had a couple, but then they ran away. And um, yeah, I, 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 haven't, I haven't picked up any more as yet. Um, so yes. Were they, were they interested in the similar things that you were or, or completely different topics? Uh, they were, yeah, no, they were, they were, they were mad keen 14th century, oh. like complete nut bars. I mean, if, if they, they ended up moving to the UK for uh, professional reasons um, and then life kind of overtook a bit. And they it kind happens. Of society. Um, otherwise, you know, they'd be elevated well and truly by now, um, which makes me a bit sad, but uh, yeah, so no, they they were uh, they were very keen on on uh, yeah, fourteenth century costuming and um, dyeing techniques and embroidery and such. And Talia, I'm guessing that you probably don't as yet. You're still no. finding your feet. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in a year and a day. So um, I won't take a student for a year and a day at the very earliest. And it'll be up to the prospective student to come up to me and say, you know, I want to learn from you. And then I'll say, okay, because again, really shy. <laughs> Not mean to go up to someone. <laughs> You're doing wonderfully tonight. Thank you. <laughs> but yes, it's, it is an odd one. It's the, the, the process of acquiring students because the way I've operated I with the exception of of uh, my of, of Karen Rowland the uh, there haven't been too many people where I've really felt that you know I could just wander up to them and go hey yeah I want to like take you guys on um which has been partially just a a, a, a part of the, the dynamics of the groups that I've been in. Um, I think friendship but, is probably a start. And then you work out whether or not you have similar interests and go from there. Or as you said, what hmm. can I, what can I teach this person? Um, and will they benefit from it and learn from that and then further themselves with your guidance as well? Well, it goes back to that imposter syndrome vibe where, you know, why would someone want to come and learn from me? Or what do I have to share? This person's already smashing it on their own. <laughs> yeah. Mistress Anne, in fact, Baroness Anne has actually said, commented in the chat saying imposter syndrome is real for all peers. Yeah. So you both started in Kaid. Um, can you tell me what some of your favorite kind of traditions under Lockhart and maybe some of the traditions that come out of Kaid might be? What, what, what do you love to see or be part of in the SCA? Thinking music. <laughs> uh, sorry, that's, that's, that's a question that demands shit stirring. Um, That's allowed. We we will get to that question, please. Hi, um, uh, No, I I think the thing that I like, in all seriousness, the thing that I like the most about being a New Zealander in Lockhart is the fact that Lockhart mostly tends to remember that we exist and that we're part of the kingdom, um, which kind of Kai was lovely, and all the the Kaiden people I dealt with were always lovely, but Kaid as a kingdom kind of tended to forget that we actually exist. Um, which, you know, given that they were a kingdom of umpty tum thousand and there was about 40 of us at the time, and it was forgivable and understandable, but the, the 
as as part of the kingdom, I've always felt that you know we are actually part of the kingdom. We're not sort of a decorative offshoot, little ornament on the shelf. Um, for better and for worse, you know, we're there. Sometimes we have arguments, but we are having the arguments um, or the disagreements about priorities, etc. Yeah. So I think without the Crescent Isle, Isles, Lockhart would definitely be less. You are definite a benefit to this kingdom. Definitely. There's um like there's there's definitely unique cultural kind of like mm. SCA cultural differences across the two, but like they're just so compatible and lovely and you love visiting over there. We love when all the people come over to Australia to visit and yeah, it's um never leave. <laughs> Please. <Yeah. laughs> uh, so back to the question, do you have a favorite tradition? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. I mean, yeah. Natalia? So um, probably the thing that I, I don't like to say disliked most about Kaid, but um, the, it, it was a benefit and a not benefit in that because Kaid and the West sit side by side, um, there and and it's northern and southern California. Uh, we had an extreme rivalry, and so we, you know, oh well, you're from the west. You know, I I got so much grief for moving over here um, because I was moving to the west. Um, and I don't know. I'm kind of like you know more of a peaceful person than than a war person. Maybe that's why I left the United States. Um, <laughs> but um, over here, I like the fact that we have a bit of a rivalry between our baronies, but we all get on. We're all, we all are definitely one kingdom. And I like that. I also like the fact that the tradition of, you know, taking the Mickey out of people comes into play in the society here. The fact that, you know, you can walk up to um, any of the royalty, you can walk up to any of the peers and you can, you know, give them a hard time and they just laugh it off is so much nicer than being in a kingdom where it's a little bit, it, it's frowned upon to walk up and just go, oh, you know, getting a little tarnished there are you you know and um so yeah so that's probably the tradition that i love the most is that we're just real people don't yeah, take that, everything so seriously i i think that sorry i think now that you say that 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 has lit up for me what i the tradition that i like the most is is that we are a very sort of egalitarian kingdom um and we we draw a line between taking things seriously and taking ourselves seriously. So, yeah. you know, whereas our crown, by and large, our crowns take their responsibility seriously, but they don't really mm -hmm. take themselves seriously. Um, you know, I, th I think people might be offended if you if you took the piss out of the crown on the throne with the crowns on being the crowns, but if the hats are on the throne and they're around the back in a private tent out of public view, not doing like public crown stuff, it's game on. Yep. I love that. Yeah. And like speaking from, from my experience, it's, and I'm not sure if Altani feels the same, but it is such a strange feeling kind of when you're all dressed up and you're doing the formal thing and, and people are bowing to you. Like it, it just makes you feel really uncomfortable. You know, you need to do it for the theater and mm. it's all part of the game and people are doing it because they enjoy playing that part. But like being there, it's just like, oh man, you're, you're better than me at all this stuff. I should be bowing to you. <laughs> you just have to smile and, and take it in. But I think that's yeah, the imposter syndrome in England. <laughs> 
Well, for some of us. Yeah. I, I did hear a story about you and Theodoric, I think in your first trip to Canterbury Fair, was it? It's one of the major events over here, Canterbury Fair or one of the old Halfen events where like mm -hmm. someone mentioned later that for the first three days you thought we all hated you because we were being so nice. Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> We loved you. We just were being nice because you're loved. <laughs> I mean, it might, that might have been one of those cultural like differences that um, between New Zealand and Australia is that there's a there's a seriousness um, with the game side of things in the Crescent Isles that um, doesn't happen as kind of uh, big in Australia. Like it's the the way that you guys um, give reverence to the crown and to the Baroni, the B and Bs, um, and kind of really get into that medieval um, hierarchy kind of theatre of it. Um, yeah, I think that was a bit of a, a shock to us. The first, like, that was our first event after coronation as well. So it was all very crazy. <laughs> that does happen here. It just depends where you are and which barony. And and I think it's it's also about the relationships. Because, I mean, I know I, I didn't really know you guys at all before you'd stepped up and, like, there, there wasn't, you know, there, there, there are plenty of people from Australia who, if they set the throne, I'd give them shit as soon as they walked in the door. Um, but if it's someone I don't know, you know, you're always going to err on the side of politeness, least they to turn out with. to be the one person from Australia who doesn't get the joke. Um, so yeah, without that sort of, you know, if you were one of Gabs and Stanzi's people or something and you'd come over with them and so I'm sure we would have been much ruder to you. <laughs> well, next time I want all the jokes. <laughs> Missed out the last last rain. He got over, but I was here with the little kid. Yep. <laughs> well, we're sort of coming to nearing the end of tonight's talk, I think. So before we go, what is there? What is your no shit there I was story? See, I told you we'd get to this. <laughs> what do you remember the most or yeah. Or just a funny story, like yeah. Natalia. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, you know, I, you know, have spent years and years and years with Drake, so I've got lots of funny stories. <laughs> um, probably one of the funniest or at least I find it funny. Um, Drake left uh, his apprentices in charge of the kitchen and he went off to go and do something, swan around like he normally does. And we had a team of people assisting because we were doing St. Floor's uh, food fund. And um, none of the apprentices were watching the cooking. We had left other people in charge and all of a sudden we hear, there's a fire. And we turn around and sure enough, the, uh, the uh, gas stove had fallen through the table and everything was on fire. So yes, we still haven't lived that down um, within the group, <laughs> but that was probably the, uh, yeah, uh, you know, trying to put out a fire before it started the big, huge Roany Festival, uh, St. Flores tent on fire, circus tent. Um, that was kind of fun. Exciting. Yeah. It's always exciting when you're with Drake. <laughs> <laughs> True. I've heard, I've heard a lot of stories of uh, accidents and potential accidents and it's got yeah, to go. I'm surprised we're not dead, you know, <laughs> really. 
you have to be accident prone to be one of Drake's apprentices. It's it's a requirement. Are you accident prone? I mean, I'm yes. not a student anymore. That's true. <laughs> um, yes, I am still accident prone. <laughs> I don't think I can grow out of that. <laughs> I think maybe um, Drake needs to take a student who's like a, a medic or a nurse or a, <laughs> like some kind of uh, someone who can help fix the problems. <laughs> We all do carry first aid kits. But is it really a responsible thing to do to take a medic or a nurse or someone who like people's lives may depend on and then infuse them with the drakiness? Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure an <laughs> accident prone nurse is uh, necessarily someone that you want operating on you. <laughs> <laughs> and have you had a thought? What? Yeah, well, I mean, I, the, the couple of things that spring to mind for my, my sort of no shit there I was, but sort of the magical moments, they're both fighting related, which given I don't really fight these days is ironic, but um, years ago, the uh, festival War Day fell on Anzac Day. And there was a lot of soul searching that went on about whether it was really appropriate to, you know, go and have a war on Anzac Day, the day when we remember, you know, people who have fallen in real wars and we have had and have a bunch of active service people. So there was like, there was there was a lot of very respectful back and forth about it. And the end result was that actually, yeah, we'd go ahead, but we'd have a minute of silence observed. And so we, everyone marched up onto the war field in full panoply. I can't word. Looking real pretty. Um, and we formed up and we took a knee and had a moment, minute of silence. And I just remember the feeling of being surrounded by 200 people under arms with the banners snapping in the wind and just the faint jingle and the solemnity of the moment and the realness of the moment combined with that excitement that something is about to happen. And it was a very sort of visceral, you know, magic moment. Um, the other magic moment was uh, you know, so, so, uh, equally visceral, but at a completely opposite end of it, was in a, a village battle we the scenario was we were we were fighting sort of bridge to city to castle and back and forth depending on which side won but we managed to pull off a beautiful flanking maneuver attacking the village we trapped the other side in an intersection and butchered them to a person um without them being able to escape from that square and uh I just remember standing there looking at the side that was the dead were la literally layered three deep. And again, it was a little bit real and a little bit just. Um, so, yeah. Um, weird fighting moments. Um, <laughs> it's, it's quite cool how immersive those environments can get sometimes. I mean, obviously, we're not dealing with the same kind of consequences as a real battle but it's um it's still there's an intensity to it that you you don't experience in other kind of parts of life it's pretty cool yeah i mean it just i mean it's it's most of the time it's good fun with friends and then every so often it just reaches out and bites you um, yes not that i fight but yes i agree with you on that i experienced that at penzik when i was over by my without king Gidei at the time when I started to watch the, the first war battle, I was terrified. Um, it, as I said, I don't fight, but it was still something there that you're seeing there's so many people on the field. You know they're not going to die, but it, it sort of brings back, this is what happened. This is the type of thing that people really did die in. And it's just a bit more, you can feel it more, I think. And energy. That comes yeah. Well, 
Well, thank you both so much for, for joining us tonight. It's been a real pleasure getting to know each of you a little bit better and getting some exciting stories about all your subjects that you love to do. So I really appreciate um, both of you joining us and, and Llewellyn, thanks for coming in later in the night. I know it's a, yes. it's a bit late over there, so thank you. Um, Best of luck to Angel tomorrow with her stair run. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was lovely seeing your new puppy too, Natalia. Thank you. <laughs> Wish you all the best with those ones. <laughs> Next week, I think we have a newcomer's perspective. So we'll have two uh, people who've only been playing in the SCA for a couple of years or I can't, maybe even less than a year before COVID came on. So it'll be really interesting to, to see their experience of, of things. So tune in for that. Um, I think that's all I've got to say. Altani, is there anything else? Thank you for hosting Duchess Anglin and our wonderful B who is hiding in the background. And again, Master and Mistress, thank you very much for being on. It was a pleasure thank to have you. you and we wish you all the very best. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. We'll see Bye. you all. <laughs> Cheers, Luckhawk.